Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my October wrap up. Today I'm going to be telling you about all the Victorian literature I read in October. So October for me every year is Victober or Victorian October. I'll leave links down below to my announcement video if you want to hear more about what Victober is. Um, but throughout the month of October, I was reading a lot of Victorian literature. So I read 16 things for Victober, 16 works of Victorian literature. And then I also read two other things, um, which I'd started in September and finished off in October, which were not Victorian. But I will do all the Victorian things first. Um, and we're gonna go through, I think in chronological order from the earliest published to the latest published. Um, I had quite a late Victorian Victober this year. I read a lot of things from the 1880s and 1890s, which I really enjoyed. As ever in Victober, we had five challenges. Kate's challenge was to read a Victorian work featuring a stranger or outsider. My challenge was to read a piece of Victorian new woman fiction. Marissa's challenge was to read a Victorian work by an author um, who's new to you. Petra's challenge was to read a Victorian first person narrative. And Ros's challenge was to read a Victorian work in which class featured strongly. I definitely ticked off all of the challenges um, and I'll try and mention which books ticked off what challenge as I go through, if I can remember. But anyway, let me get into the books. First up, I want to mention Night and Morning by Ebel Bower Lytton. This is the first book by Ebel Bower Lytton that I've read. So, you know, fits into Marissa's challenge. Um, and it ended up being a real surprise hit for me, a book that I really enjoyed. It's one of those longer Victorian books um, and it is a bit of a building's romance. We're following a young boy um, from his childhood into his adulthood. His name's Philip um, and his parents have a private marriage, a secret marriage. Um, before his birth, he's born, he's raised as a gentleman. But although his parents were married, um, because his father has never told his family about his marriage, fearing his family would disapprove, um, that means that when Philip's father passes away, um, whether or not the marriage was real is called into question. Philip is deemed to be illegitimate, he isn't able to inherit his father's property, um, and his father's family basically leave him, his brother and his mother um, on the poverty line um, without giving them any assistance. And the book basically follows Philip and sometimes his brother Sidney from that point onwards um, and we see the shape of their lives. It's a book that to me felt quite Dickensian in some ways. It had a lot of similar themes to Dickens, um, especially it kind of looked in a similar way to Dickens does at themes of class and poverty, definitely taking off Ross's challenge there as well. And in fact, like the whole premise of the book is basically that Philip is treated like an outsider because he's presumed to be illegitimate. So taking off Kate's challenge there too. And there were a lot of other Dickensian elements, you know, recurring characters and a lot of coincidences and things like that. Um, and in some ways, I think this is a book you'll really enjoy if you like books like Great Expectations or David Copperfield. Saying that, I didn't really have the humour of Dickens. Like in general, I'd say that over mood was more somber and it also kind of reminded me of um the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas because the theme of revenge is definitely running through the book quite a lot and also there is a bit of like 10 year gap in time and a character reappears with a new name kind of thing um so I feel like if you like the Count of Monte Cristo you also might like Night and Morning it's not quite as epic as the Count of Monte Cristo but um it did give me that kind of similar feel. Overall, I really liked Night and Morning, and yeah, I'm excited to read more by Elba Bo Lytton in the future. Next up, in chronological order, I have um, the two bits of poetry that I read this month. Um, so first we have In Memoriam by Alfred Lord Tennyson from 1850, um, and this is a first person narrative, so it ticks off Petra's challenge. In Memoriam is a long poem about grief, um, an elegy that Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote for um, a friend of his who had passed away. I say friend, it does read in quite a lot of of In Memoriam like there was a more romantic bond than that um, but you know who knows. In Memoriam I have kind of mixed feelings about on the one hand I think it is very powerful and there are a lot of really powerful striking passages about grief but on the other hand I feel like I would have got the same thing out of it if it had been a quarter of the length. Um, and actually, I don't think it was a full reread for me, but I had read bits of it before, like extracted in anthologies, and I feel like I had probably read all the best bits before. I don't know, it's a bit difficult to say because I also listened to this on audiobook, and the audiobook was okay, but it wasn't like the best audiobook ever. And 
I feel like maybe listening to an audiobook was not the best experience. So I had kind of mixed feelings about Emma Moriam, but I am glad that I finally read it in full. And then I also read Goblin Market and other poems by Christina Rossetti. This came out in 1862 um, and I really, really enjoyed this. This was a really for me. I think I had probably read every poem in this collection before, but I definitely read the majority before. I think I've got Christina Rossetti's collected poems somewhere. Um, she's one of my favourite poets and I really like her and I really enjoyed this collection. A lot of these are written in first person too, so that could count for um, Petra's Challenge. Um, and I really enjoyed so many of the poems in here. Goblin Market itself is a longer, more fairy tale poem, which I really enjoy. But my favourite poem in this collection is actually a poem called Convent Threshold, which I just think is fantastic. I really love the way Christina Rossetti uses rhythm and rhyme. I don't know exactly what it is about it, but I just really, really love it. Anyway, this was great. The next book I have to mention is Man and Wife by Wilkie Collins, which was published in 1870. And this book I think will probably tick off both Ros's challenge and Kate's challenge. Um, and this was a really, really interesting read. I find Wilkie Collins very hit and miss for me. Like, I I have absolutely loved some of his books and I have very much hated others um, but Man and Wife was definitely a hit for me it was fantastic there were a few passages that really annoyed me because sometimes Wilkie Collins is just like sexist in a very specific way that specifically really really infuriates me more than the general sexism you encounter in Victorian literature I don't exactly know quite why it is that it makes me so angry but it really does anyway Man and Wife is a fantastic really gripping powerful novel with a amazing characterization. It's a bit hard to explain the premise because although the pacing is very good, it does take you quite a long time to get to the actual central premise of the book. But after a lengthy prologue setting up a very complicated backstory to do with interesting marriage law, um, the book focuses on these two young women, um, Blanche and Anne. Anne is a bit older than Blanche, they've been friends and Anne has been her governess and now they're both grown up and Blanche has met a nice young man who she wants to marry. Meanwhile, Anne is in a very different difficult position where she has had a sexual relationship outside of marriage with a young man who is not very reliable and she is now trying to persuade this young man to marry her um, and everything goes on from there and the plot is just fantastic like I said before that there are some Wilkie Collins books where he writes in a very sensational, dramatic way, but actually everything could be solved by a simple conversation. But in Man and Wife, the plot is genuinely really, really dramatic, really pacey. All the stakes are as high as Wilkie Collins suggests they are by the way he writes. And it's really, really fantastic. I also think the characterization is very, very good, um, especially Jeffrey Delamain. I feel like his psychology um, and his characterization overall was just absolutely absolutely impeccably drawn um, and it really like made me think about how talented Wilkie Collins is even when he annoys me like I feel like Man and Wife is just such a good book. I have now read I think 12 Wilkie Collins books and I think Man and Wife is probably objectively the best one I have read. I think I possibly like The Moonstone more because I really like what Wilkie Collins does with narrative voice and lots of multiple perspectives in The Moonstone but I feel like in terms of the plot and the characterization and the premise. Like, I feel like Man and Wife is just the best. I would really recommend it. It's a very, very, very strong Wilkie Collins book. Sticking in the 1870s, the next thing that I read was The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. This is a book from 1875 and this was our group read for October. So a lot of people were reading this and actually it's been so lovely on the Discord server. I feel like so many people absolutely love this, which made me very happy because this is one of my favourite Victorian books ever. This was a reread for me um, and it was just so nice to see so many people enjoying this book. This book counts for Ros's challenge there is so much about class in here and it also counted for Kate's challenge because at the heart of this book is a character called Mr Melmot um, who appears in London with a massive fortune no one knows where he's made his money no one knows where he's from but him and his family are here and they have a lot of money so everyone flocks to them everyone wants a piece of the giant Melmot pie um, and basically this book is about all of the people who surround Melmot um, and everything that goes on from there it is a book about class and money and love and um, changing social norms and I just think it is genuinely fantastic like I love it so much and I was so pleased that so many people enjoyed it this October because it's such a good book I love the characterization I love the way it looks at class and money and the complicated dynamics between them I love all the social criticism in here I love the way Anthony Trollope writes Marie Melmot Mr Melmot's daughter is just one of my favorite characters in all of Trollope and I feel like her arc is just 
just wonderful and so well done. This book is just so good in every way and I just highly, highly recommend it. And speaking on Anthony Trollope, this month I also read An Eye for an Eye by him, which was published in 1879, though apparently he wrote it in 1870. Um, and this was a fantastic, fantastic book, which again, I think would count for both Ros's and Kate's challenge. This book has a fairly conventional Anthony Trollope setup at the beginning. We have an elderly Earl and after the death of his only son, um, he invites his nephew, his new heir, to come and live with him. This young man is in the army and he says he will come and live with his uncle but he wants to finish off one last year in the army because he enjoys it. When the young man is visiting his uncle, the Earl, he is introduced to a woman who his uncle and aunt would like him to marry. But while away in Ireland with his regiment, he has met a young Irish Roman Catholic girl whose family are possibly not that respectable um, and who he knows his Protestant upper class English family would not approve of. And this book is basically about what happens. And you think you know where it's going, but you also kind of don't. This book is a really, really fantastic Anthony Trollope and a very surprising one. This book has, as I said, a kind of conventional Trollope setup, but we also have this title, An Eye for an Eye, which tells you things are going to possibly get a bit dark. And we know from a kind of prologue to the book that one of these characters is going to end up in an asylum, and we don't know why. And it just is fantastic. Like, the ending is just really, really good. And there were some wonderful moments in here and some fantastic characterization. And I feel like one of the things I love so much about this book, and which I love so much about Anthony Trollope as a whole, is that his psychology is always is really really interesting like there are so many characters who exist in kind of gray areas between good and bad um and Trollope just examines that so well and also the way your feelings about particular characters change across the course of this not very long novel is just like really really well done I just thought this was so good like I just thought this was such a fantastic Anthony Trollope book and I highly 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 recommend it it's a really really good one um pretty short too and yeah very compelling, very, very interesting. I would definitely recommend it. Moving on to the 1880s, I also read A Burglary by Amy Dillon from 1883, which again, I think would pretty much count both for Ross's challenge and for Kate's. Lots about class in here, and there is also definitely an outsider figure. This book is set mostly in Wales, partly in London, and it focuses around a burglary, as you might imagine from the title. So there is a family, a father and his two children, um, and a cousin has come to stay, and this cousin is a very wealthy heiress. And one day, the house gets burgled, her jewels are stolen and she is left tied up. And basically this book follows the ramifications of this burglary, both how it affects the family um, whose house is broken into and also how it affects the man himself who committed the burglary. I love Amy Dillon very much. She's becoming a real favourite Victorian author of mine and I feel like this would be a great place to start with her work actually. There was so much in this book that interested me but I think especially the psychology of the burglar um, was just done really well and was really really fascinating. Um, like looking at how he was portrayed and um, um, the way his mind worked was just really interesting and also his kind of arc over the course of the novel was really curious too. But I also enjoyed all the other characterization in here. Imogen um, and her cousin Ethel, the heiress, are really interesting figures. Overall I just thoroughly enjoyed this one and it's definitely a book I would recommend. The next thing I have to mention also from 1883 is a play and that is Afternoon by Weeder. I'd never read anything by Weeder before so this counted for me for Marissa's challenge and also for my own challenge as it was a work of new woman fiction. Afternoon is a great play which follows what happens when a man meets again um, his wife who he believed was dead and believed died 12 years ago. She knows who he is and she recognises him but he doesn't recognise her because she's now under an assumed name and it's been quite a long time. He treated her badly 12 years ago um, and what will happen now they've met again. Really really good play, definitely one I'd recommend. I didn't completely love the ending but I still thought it was a really good read. Also from 1883 we have A Struggle for Fame by Charlotte Riddell which I love this was a real highlight of the month and this takes off a lot of challenges for me actually because it is a new woman novel um, it's by an author I'd never read before there's a lot about class in it and there's also quite a lot in it about being an outsider because um, the book follows two people a young man and a young woman um, who at the beginning of the novel move from Ireland to London and the book follows both of their attempts to become authors um, in the kind of complicated difficult publishing scene of the mid 19th century. This book was so good in so many ways I loved it so much. The characterization was great and the kind of 
arcs that all the characters go on were really good. This book takes place probably over between sort of 10 and 15 years. But what I love most about this book is the way that it looks at the publishing industry and what it meant to be an author and an editor in the 19th century. Stuff that I'm just fascinated by. This book looks so interestingly about the relationships between authors and editors. Um, it looks at kind of what it meant to be a novelist in the Victorian period, what it meant to be a female novelist in the Victorian period and how that was different from being a male novelist. And it just was so interesting and so good and also so so well written like it was a really easy read in many ways really accessible Victorian novel um, and just the joy I just loved this so much and it was funny as well like even though there were parts of it that were quite grim there were also parts that really made me smile and really made me laugh and I just loved this so much this is so good possibly my favorite of the month I don't know I've read a lot of fantastic things this month but it was very very good and I highly highly recommend this one it was great the next book I want to mention is Miss Meredith by Amy Levy from 1888. This book is a first person narrative, so meeting Petra's challenge about a young woman who travels from London to Italy to become a governess there, so definitely counting for Kate's challenge too. And while there she ends up kind of forming a romantic attachment to a relation of her employers who is of a much higher class than her, ticking off Ros's challenge too. This is quite a short and sweet novella. Like I liked it but I feel like it wasn't terribly developed because it was so short. And I I feel like the ideas it was playing with were like not as interesting as um, the ideas in say A Romance of a Shop by Amy Levy which I also read and really really loved. One thing I did really enjoy about Miss Meredith though is that it's a book that is very much in conversation with the Brontes um, so there's even a bit at the very beginning of the book before she goes off to become a governess where she's talking with her sisters about Jane Eyre um, and sort of saying how ridiculous Jane Eyre is in a way I suppose which I found very entertaining and I feel like part of what Amy Levy wanted to do in Miss Meredith was take the premise of Jane Eyre but write it in the style of Agnes Grey if that makes sense so I feel like I sort of loved it as a Bronte retelling but I also feel like it could have been a lot more developed but I also kind of feel like she was doing something really fun so I feel like if you've read Jane Eyre and Agnes Grey and you really like them both then I feel like you might enjoy Miss Meredith for the fun Bronte retelling stuff she's doing but I feel like as a book on its own it was just a little bit underdeveloped for me but it was fun and it was very short so you know a mixed review I guess. Then another book I read this month was In Darkest London by Margaret Harkness from 1889 and um, this was very much a book about class and poverty so definitely one that fitted for Ros's challenge. I would say this is probably my least favourite book of the month um, but I do have quite complicated mixed feelings on it. I would say that this is a book that you might want to read if you're really interested in looking from a historical angle at urban poverty in the late 19th century but as a novel I don't feel it's very strong but I also feel like it's not trying to be very strong as a novel. I feel like it is much more about kind of the social um political points that it is getting across. So In Darkest London is set in the 1880s in Whitechapel and it's basically looking at a lot of people who are living in grinding poverty and at the people who are trying to help them. So this book um, chiefly focuses on a Salvation Army officer um, who is kind of moving from place to place seeing lots of different people. He meets a lot of people in different situations and he meets a lot of people from different schools of thought so um, there's a lot of discussion about religion, he meets people from different branches of Christianity he has a friend who is an agnostic he meets people who are involved in socialism or who have really strong feelings about women's rights and the book kind of looks at a lot of different schools of thought um, that were kind of being examined in the late Victorian period. I think like I said in one of my vlogs I feel like this book has all of the misery of The Netherworld by George Gissing which is another book about grinding poverty in London in the 1880s but it just has none of what makes The Netherworld fantastic so I feel like this is a kind of a book to read like as a historical source rather than a novel I would recommend as a novel and um, there's also quite a lot of ableism in it which you know is something you find in quite a few Victorian novels but I feel like it's much more extreme or at least much more like in your face in this novel I guess and um, so that's worth being aware of too so yeah I'm kind of glad I read it because it was historically interesting but it's not really a book I'd recommend. I'll do something completely different with a very different tone. I also read My Flirtations by Ella Hepworth Dixon from 1892. This is a light-hearted episodical novel in which a young woman recounts all of the different flirtations that she has had, all of the different men she's flirted with and all of their different qualities and flaws. My Flirtations was just a really really good fun book and um, it was very short as well. I think I read it in about two hours and it was just just excellent fun. 
one. This is written in the first person, so it would count for Petra's challenge. And I reckon it could kind of fit into my challenge to read a new woman book as well. Because although the main character, um, the narrator, is not really much of a new woman, um, her sister Christina kind of is. Um, and her sister Christina has no interest in marriage or men and is just sort of the, always there in the corner of rolling her eyes as the narrator flirts with lots of different people, which I found very, very entertaining. The dynamic between them was great. So I'd highly recommend My Flirtations. Great fun. Well worth your time. Then next, I have a couple more plays to mention. I read Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas from 1892. I hadn't read anything by Brandon Thomas before, so this ticked off Marissa's challenge for me. Um, and I really, really enjoyed this one. This was just great fun. So the basic setup of this play is that there are two young men at university and one of them, his aunt, is coming to visit. He's never seen her before because she's been living abroad. Um, and they decide that the visit of his aunt is a great excuse to invite the two young ladies they're in love with around to lunch. And there's kind of an urgency to the lunch because the two young ladies are about to go off to Scotland and they're not sure when they'll see them again and they both want to propose before the young women go away. But then they get a telegram saying that Charlie's aunt is not coming to visit and they don't know what to do because they can't have the two young ladies to lunch without a chaperone there. But then they see one of their other friends um, who is just trying on his costume for an amateur dramatics production that he is meant to be in later. And the role he is playing in this amateur dramatics production is of an older woman. Um, and so when they see him looking like an older woman, they say, well, you can be Charlie's aunt, we'll pretend you're Charlie's aunt, and then we'll have a chaperone and everything will be respectable. And everything kind of goes on from there. This play is so funny, and I feel like it's a lot funnier than I was expecting it to be. Like, I feel like I was kind of thinking for the premise that it would feel quite dated, and a lot of the humour would just be, you know, look a young man is pretending to be an older woman but actually a lot of the humor comes from other places and the humor is really really sharp like i just really really enjoyed this and i'd really recommend it um i feel like from the premise i was expecting it to be less good but actually i just think it's really really fun and um, so i highly recommend this um very very entertaining play and yeah just well worth your time. And then another play I read this month was Condida by George Bernard Shaw from 1894, which I didn't love that much. Usually I really, really like George Bernard Shaw, but I didn't massively love Condida. I just didn't get on with it as much as I have his other plays. I feel like it just kind of lacked the emotional depth and the like thematic depth of something like Mrs. Warrior's Profession, but it also just wasn't as fun as something like You Never Can Tell. It's basically kind of set up as a bit of a love triangle where there is um, a man and his wife and then a young man who's sort of 10 years younger than them um, who they've become friends with who has fallen in love with the wife and um, then it kind of is about her in relation to them and yeah I just kind of didn't quite love it and I feel like I don't even have that much to say about it I just I just didn't really believe in any of the characters which I feel like is never usually the case when I read George Bernard Shaw it was meant to be a work of new women fiction so the internet told me but I'm not sure it really was. Then another book I read this October was Ease Ransom by George Gissing from 1895. Um, and this book would definitely fit into Ros's challenge as it is very much about class. It's all about class and money, really. So Ease Ransom follows a young man who is um, kind of from the upper working classes. So he is a bit more educated and he is kind of a skilled labourer, I suppose. But he is living quite close to the breadline um, and he's never had much disposable income until suddenly one day he unexpectedly gets um, several hundred pounds as he decides he's going to leave his job and live for a few years he decides he's going to enjoy himself for a few years and while he's living in London trying to like experience as much of life as possible he meets this young woman called Eve um, and becomes very very interested in her I feel like saying more than that would spoil the book but I feel like the book is really at its heart about money and the influence of money and the way that money affects the way the humans relate to each other. And I thought it was really, really, really good. I love George Gissing. I think he's fantastic. Um, and I feel like Ease Ransom is a book that like, I feel like I need to sit down and think about it for a long time, which maybe I need to do with all Gissing because he's just that kind of writer. But I feel like I wasn't always sure what direction the plot was gonna go in. Um, and the ending of the thought was really, really interesting. I feel like all the characterization was really interesting because I kind of, I didn't love anyone, except maybe Patty. I did love Patty. But both Eve and Hilliard are like quite complicated figures. Um, but I just thought they were drawn so well. And I just really, really enjoyed this one. So I would definitely recommend Eve's Ransom. I thought it was a really, really interesting read um, and a bit shorter than the other Gettings I've read as well, if that's useful for anyone to know. Then finally, um, the last Victober book I have to talk to you about today was The Beth Book by Sarah Grand from 1897. I'd never read a novel by Sarah Grand before. Um, so this counted for me for Marissa's challenge 
and this is also a new woman movement which was my challenge for this booktober um, and this book is such an interesting work of new woman fiction I feel like it is one of the strongest works of new woman fiction I've read in terms of um, the way it looks at feminist issues the best book is a really really fantastic coming of age story which tells a story of a girl called Beth from her childhood into her adulthood and I feel like this is a book that was so interesting as a building's roman because it is not just a book about a character growing up but it's so much about how Beth's mind is formed and I feel like this book gets so close into Beth's head and her psychology in the most interesting way that I just loved like we spend a lot of time in her childhood kind of seeing how she becomes the person she later is um, and seeing how she relates to the people around her and um, she gets into a lot of trouble because she always speaks her mind and she has a real like intellectual curiosity in a lot of things even when the people around her think she shouldn't Throughout the book there are a lot of feminist themes um, and throughout Beth's childhood there is a lot of discussion of the fact that Beth's education is so unequal to the education of her brother. But the feminist themes kind of really come into their fore when we get into her adulthood. I kind of don't want to say too much because I'm worried about getting into spoilers um, but I just thought this book was so fantastic in so many ways um, and I just loved it like I just feel like the Beth book was so interesting in terms of being this wonderful character study and also being a book that looks at really feminist themes that looks at um, the life of writers in the Victorian period that looks interestingly at power dynamics between men and women um, and I just I just thought it was really 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 wonderful and I highly highly recommend it it is quite a long book and I feel like I've heard a couple of people say that they felt it was too long but I kind of just loved spending that long in Beth's head so I'm kind of delighted um, and yeah, I really recommend the best book. I thought it was fantastic. Just a really, really wonderful book. Okay, so those are the 16 things that I read for Victober. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time because I've read a lot of things and I had a lot of thoughts and I just, yeah, I had a wonderful Victober reading these fantastic books. I feel like I want to say my two favourites were the best book and, um... A struggle for fame but I feel like that's partly because because they were new authors to me I was like even more surprised by how much I loved them I feel like Man and Wife by Wilkie Collins um, and I for an Eye by Anthony Trollope and A Burglary by Amy Dillwyn were all probably as good as the Beth book and A Struggle for Fame but because they were by authors I've read before I was like less less delightedly surprised to read a truly wonderful book by them but they were absolutely fantastic too and yeah it's just been a very good Victober I've read some really really fantastic things but as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I did also read two things in October that weren't Victorian, so I'll quickly mention them at the end. Um, so one of them was another play, and that was Enemy of the People by Henrik Ibsen. This is a play from 1882, um, so same time as the Victorian period, but um, from a Norwegian writer. I really like Ibsen. I have read and seen quite a few of his plays before, um, and I read Enemy of the People for my book club, where we read a play, a poetry collection, and a short story every month. I found Enemy of the People really, really interesting. It tells a story of this small spa town and what happens when um, the doctor in this town discovers that there is something unhealthy about the, the spa, the baths. And when he decides to publish his findings, um, people in the town start to turn against him and it's kind of about what happens there. But it's actually a lot more like a morally grey and complicated than that as always with Ibsen. It's a really strong play. Ibsen is a great playwright um, and yeah, I'm going to go see it on stage when it's on in London next year, which I'm very, very excited for. And then the other thing that I finished off in October, which I've been reading since September, was Three Act Tragedy by Agatha Christie, which is from 1934. My husband Nick and I are working our way through the Poirot novels. Um, I had read Three Act Tragedy before, but he hadn't. And I really enjoyed rereading this one. I think it's a good Agatha Christie, good Poirot novel with a fun setup. One thing I really enjoy about this book is all the like theatrical references in it. Um, so it's called Three Act Tragedy, obviously, um, and it starts at a house party of an actor. Um, and at this house party, someone dies mysteriously, and Poirot is present um, and of course he's going to end up trying to work out what happened um, to this man and afterwards. It's a really really interesting book with a good cast of characters and yeah a good strong Agatha Christie. I really really enjoyed this one. So there we go those are all the books that I read in October. Um, I read a lot in October so I'm sorry if this has been a very long video but I just had a lot to say about those wonderful Victorian books. So that's all for now. Do let me know down in the comments did you have a good Victober? Did you join in? What did you read? What was your favourite book of the month? And that's all for now. Thanks so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.